questions before we start today? <laughs> Boy, it looks like maybe extra credit day today again, huh? All right, let's do it. Extra credit. Um, uh, formula for the real interest rate, which is our little r. 30 seconds. You can talk to your neighbor. You can talk to your out loud. You can copy your neighbor's paper. You can do whatever you want, but you've got 21 more seconds to calculate the formula. Eleven seconds. Okay, don't want to spend too much last time with this. Pass them forward. Need all the papers in my hand in the next ten seconds. Ten. Nine. Eight. Seven. Six. Five. Four, three, two, one, zero. Okay. So, um, last lecture I screwed up a bit on the wealth effect. So I want you to pull out your notes to uh, the supply loanable fund shifters. Uh, number two, we wrote some stuff down on the wealth effect. <coughs> and after further review from the replay official, I thought I put down there an increase in wealth leads to an increase in savings, is that right? It's a decrease in the supply of loanable funds. So here, here's the thought. Our wealth bucket is the accumulation of previous savings. So as you become wealthier, your perception of wealth, it might <laughs> cause you to save less today is what we find on average. Okay, it might not be true for every individual, of course, but on average we find that. So the housing crisis was, was typical of this. Um, what was happening to your parents' houses and people that you know? What was happening to their housing price as we were going through the 2000s, up before the crisis of 2008? They were going up. So what was happening to their bucket of wealth? as their house started to appreciate in value like it never had before. It went up, right? So imagine if we think about our wealth bucket in the form of a house, um, if your house was worth 150,000 and you were carrying a, well, let's just say $140,000 debt, the good old American way, fairly low down or whatever to get into that house, you had $10,000 worth of contribution of the house towards your net wealth, your net worth, your net assets, the things we talked about last time. So as the housing bubble starts to go on, it's not worth 150 next year, it's worth 160. And all of a sudden, this number turns to 20. Next year, woo! Prices are just climbing and climbing. And by the way, you're possibly paying off some of that debt even as we go. I'm just holding that constant. But now you've got $40,000 worth of wealth. <laughs> so as you started, people started to have the perception that they were doing okay. They didn't need to maybe save as much money as they did before from their paycheck. Because remember, the savings we're looking at is our separation of consumption and savings in terms of the flow each year from our disposable income. Eh, maybe I don't have to put, I used to save 15% of my income, but I'm gonna back down to 10 because my house is taking care of my savings needs, right? So you start to have this uh, change in behavior on the amount you're saving per year 
um, with this wealth effect. And all the rest of what we put in there about inflation, inflation would tend to uh, decrease your real wealth, causing you to actually save more. So all of that that we had in the notes was fine, but wanted to clean that up. Any questions? Okay, well, we're going to wrap up this stuff and start talking about money today. We still got a few things left to go in the loadable funds, which is chapter seven. And I want to go back to the picture we left off last time. So you don't really, you don't necessarily have to redraw what I'm doing. If you've got it from last time, we can kind of look. I'm just going to show the um, loanable funds market and the effects of a government deficit. So we kind of did two separate uh, phases here. We had the private uh, demand for loanable funds, which was businesses. So I, I used the notation with a little PVT in your textbook. It just says private PDLF. So the private demand, private sector meaning non-government involved. So these are our businesses that are looking to borrow funds. And we have the private supply of loanable funds, which would be our households. Our private supply of loanable funds. And together, they would determine some sort of interest rate. Let's just call it R1 and, and Q1. All right, so then the government comes into the market because they don't have enough uh, tax collections to pay for the weapons of mass destruction. And so the demand for loanable funds in reality is out here. Now notice that I left the P off. So this is our demand for loanable funds taking into account that we have kind of the government and the private sector in the picture. What did it do? These two groups are competing for the same amount of funds that are out there, which drives up the interest rates. The private firm's behavior is still right here. That hasn't changed. We've just added the government into the picture. And so we captured the decrease in private funds falling to here. And the total amount of loanable funds cranking out to here. At this new higher interest rate, I think we used 6% last time. So let's just say it rose, for, interest rates rose from 5 to 6%. This horizontal distance here represented the amount of the deficit. That's how many dollars the government borrowed and crowded out private investment. OK, so the total amount of money now being lent is a combination of government borrowing and if we did the same up here that horizontal distance is this amount this is really the private borrowing all right so the very last thing i left you with was something called the ricardo barrow effect ricardo barrow Now, for an extra credit point, since I'm being so generous this morning, Ricardo, ring a bell for you. Who is David Ricardo? Economist, king of England. OK, so he was way back. Uh, good, John, let me mark you down here. So we had the king of England guy. Yes, that was David Ricardo. And. With our international trade, he's the one who came up with comparative advantage. Comparative advantage versus absolute advantage in trade. Jocelyn, you on the phone? Yes, OK, minus one. Um, so he's the guy that was on the international trade front and came up with comparative advantage, absolute advantage, all the gains from trade. Robert Barrow, on the other hand, was a 1970s economist, or he, he started looking at this particular uh, element in the 1970s and said, hey, 
you know, it's possible that households might save some money because of their future tax liability. So he wrote a journal article, and some of his colleagues that he submitted to this journal article said, wait a second, that rings a bell. And so after he submitted it, they figured out, kind of buried deep into some of the language, Ricardo mentioned this concept as well. And so then it became known as the Ricardo Barrow effect, giving Ricardo kind of first dibs. We're not totally saying Barrow was cheating and copying a little bit of plagiarism. Probably wasn't the case at all because it was kind of buried deep. So we weren't calling him a cheat, but we now share the name between both parties coming up with this concept, uh, David Ricardo, a long time ago. So what the effect is, is simply an increase in savings, an increase in savings <coughs> by uh, households in response to expected future tax rate increases to pay for the deficit today. Precisely what we outlined last time, but we just didn't write it down. In theory, we could even go so far as to say, well, what if the savings, how far does it go? Well, if it went all the way to my golf club here, right here, then it's possible that it would completely offset the crowding out effect, right? So it's like government, hey government, you borrow, you borrow money, but I know that you gotta pay for it at some point, and the private response is to increase savings, it's possible that we'd be back at this equilibrium and we would have private sector unaffected, right? It would totally offset the crowding out effect, potentially. But that really doesn't happen as near as economists could tell by estimating that effect. Uh, but it is something out there that uh, we would suggest partially offsets that deficit. I think a lot of that concept is what's going on today since the recession. The government's kind of a mess right now. They're fighting with each other. Uh, new president, you know, it, Barack's in office now for a second term, but that was kind of unknown for a while. Uh, companies, households, businesses, all kinds of, of uh, constituents in the United States and stakeholders kind of hunkering down, right? Not really sure what they're gonna do. So they might have been saving some money, short-term money, loanable funds, saving money that they may have otherwise put into uh, more productive uses. Um, so it's kind of changed their behavior. So this is, this is an important, uh, important point. So I'll just, we'll add that last note here. Um, the, uh, let's call it the RB effect here. Ricardo Barrow effect uh, is likely to only partially offset the crowding out. So we have two different effects there, the crowding out effect and then this Ricardo Barrow effect. Okay, last questions on that. All right, last topic. We're gonna talk about the rest of the world fairly quickly. We're not, we, we've talked about it a bit already. Oh, by the way, if you guys wanted to add, I did the golf club, but I guess I didn't. You could just put a little dashed line if you want with the Ricardo Barrow effect that that increase in savings is what would be going on. Um, I want to draw three graphs side by side. So leave enough room on your paper to get three, three graphs side by side. 
things that's unique about financial markets is that they don't sleep very often. Why do we say that the financial markets don't sleep? Why do you think that might be? We got, let's say, a lot of activity on the New York Stock Exchange, for instance. But, and it, it bell, bell rings at four, nine to four type of time frame, but yet we say the financial markets never sleep. What other markets kick on when the New York Stock Exchange shuts down? Are there other nations, right? So there's big ones. The Japanese have a big uh, financial market. And we've got the London market. So we've got financial markets around the globe. And that's what's unique about the loanable funds market is that funds, supplier, um, savers, and demanders are kind of free to roam the globe for money. They're free to roam the globe. There's people that want to put money in all over, and the markets don't go to sleep very fast. So when we uh, think about the interest rates, they're really global. So I want you to think of this being the world market for loanable funds. And in fact, this is the one that we just drew over here. We're really thinking about the world market for loanable funds. We kind of talked about it in bits and pieces to kind of help build the case, and that's why I'm ending with this, to think about all the player's behavior being in one spot. All right, so anybody remember the old eyeball trick? Remember the eyeball trick from uh, chapter 15, the international trade stuff? I had that eyeball trick where we kind of equalized. Well, that's what's going on here in the, in the world market. We've got some countries over here that we'll call international lenders. International lenders. Places like China. Remember we talked about how they're great savers. And then over here, we're just going to kind of characterize what an international borrower looks like. What country would be guilty of that? The good old U.S. of A, right? We would be one of the primary international borrowers. All right, so um, if we think about it in terms of, oh, kind of like comparative advantage and what the cost was, remember when we were on the sides of these things and we were talking about food or cars or some other good, uh, the high cost country ended up being what? The exporter of that good or the importer? The importer, right? So the, the country that had the highest cost ultimately went to the other country to buy it and then they ended up getting it cheaper, right? And the country that was the low cost provider of that good, they were able to sell it to the rest of the world now, when we opened up international trade, prices changed within each country, right? So now I want you to think about loanable funds and the interest rates that float around the globe. So over in a place like China, we might have a demand and a supply of loanable funds that would lead to a very low interest rate of, let's say, 2%. The Chinese could go right about their business Funding, these are, uh, imagine uh, Chinese businesses wanting to borrow funds. These are Chinese households that are wanting to supply funds and China just goes about their business and the market clears at uh, interest rate domestically of 2% and they get some sort of uh, funds being traded with each other over the course of the year. Meanwhile, over in the US of A, our appetite for debt is much higher. And so we have interest rates up at 5%. And we have a fully functioning credit market. It's no big deal. We've got businesses that are active in trying to grow their companies. And we've got households that are uh, saving some money. And the market in the United States, our international borrower, clears at 
five percent. All right, so now the old eyeball trick. If the rest of the world was offering a 2% interest rate, would the Chinese demanders or suppliers be interested in playing the global market? No, right? If the rest of the world offered 2%, they're like, well, I already borrow money at 2%. Well, I already supply money at 2%. No big deal, I'm, I'm happy at home. Don't need to participate in the global market at all. So one point on their willingness to supply funds to the rest of the world would be there. Now, if you tell, if China starts looking at those Americans and they're like, well, geez, these guys are up at 5%, Chinese are saying, I'd be more than happy to supply funds at that kind of rate. Gosh, our domestic firms are only paying two. That'd be awesome, as long as the risk and other considerations were the same. Um, I'm willing to loan them money at a higher rate. So imagine at 5%, that's way too high maybe for the Chinese to be wanting much funds, but the Chinese households would be willing to supply a bunch of funds, and we start to track in. All right, so the eyeball trick. In the global scheme of things, if we think about imagine all the people Living for today. All right, right. The big global picture. The amount of money being <laughs> borrowed has to be equal to the amount of money being lended. Right? Somebody's got to be doing it. What I gave to you is what you gave to me. Imports got equal exports. That whole concept is the same in the financial markets. The amount of money being borrowed has to be equal to the amount of money being lended. Well. That's what we got here with the eyeball trick. The quantity of loanable funds that are going to roam the globe have to be equal to each other for the lenders and the borrowers. So as you bring your eyeball up this way, the amount being dumped to the world market is getting bigger. As your eyeball comes down this way, the amount being dumped to the world market is getting bigger. Find out where those two distances are equal. On my particular set, I'm coming in right here. So on the global scene, the amount of money that's being borrowed is equal to the amount of money being lent. So lending equals borrowing on the global scene. And then that horizontal distance here is where the supply of loanable funds and the demand for loanable funds intersects in our global world. So this is the picture that we spend the most time on in this chapter. Now we've brought together all the players, international governments, are they borrowing or lending? The domestic government, the United States, are they borrowing or lending? United States savers, what are they doing? Global savers, what are they doing? Global borrowers, what are they doing? It's an international market for loanable funds. OK, questions or comments on that? All right, we're going to talk a little bit more on international stuff uh, a couple chapters from now when we get into foreign exchange market. Time to talk about money. So, chapter eight. His own money. We thought we'd never get there, but here we are. So, um, I want to ask you a question. What are different ways to pay for a good? 
Not meant to be a trick question. How do you guys pay for goods? Credit. credit. So we whip out credit card. What else? Cash. Cash. Loans. Loans. All kinds of payments. I want to. I want to try to brainstorm all the different things, ways we could acquire stuff, make payments. Trading. Okay. Trade. Good for good. Good for good. Government aid. How is that working when you go to Walmart? Food stamps, right? So they give you a, a card now. There used to be literally be kind of stamps, little coupons that they'd use. So they pretty much have a card. So food stamps card. Okay, what else? Cash was currency, a check, good. We could, a check. Now, how many of you actually have, I, I would seriously like to see a show of hands, I don't know if there's a sign on the time, but how many of you have checks? Like, I just used one today to make a payment. How many don't have checks? Is anybody paperless with checks? Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six. So about eh, a fourth of you or so. So paper checks, you probably have a checking account though, right? Yeah. But you just don't buy the checks, right? So you, you're just relying on, on uh, your part. So we got checks. Um, so those of you who, one of, one of our answers that isn't on here right now, those of you who don't have checks, how do you pay for stuff? Debit, debit card, good. So we got the debit card, we got the credit card. How else do we pay for stuff? Gift cards. Gift cards. Good. Need a little more room here. To... Eight gift cards. Okay. Mommy money. Mom money. So kind of a transfer gift. Okay. What else? But, and we had already had loans. You said, you mentioned the word borrowing, but is mom giving you money or, or loaning you money? All right, she's getting, that's what I thought. So it was a transfer of money, okay. What else? We got other means of payments. Do you guys use your debit card on your internet purchases always? PayPal, that's another one. Like what? Oh, so providing services instead of, okay. Provide. Provide. Oh, now we're getting more specific on what types of services. Sounds like a cover up to me. Provide services for goods. I will even put that example like raking leaves. Okay. I want to be clear on that. What else? We got currency, credit cards, loans, trade, food stamps, checks, debit cards. What goes with this? There's one kind of obvious one here. Cash, paper, currency, or coin. Coin might be a separate one. A little bit different. Okay. I think there's a few more we could come up with. How else do you get funds or pay for funds? Might even, no, nah, nah, could be an internet transaction possibly. If you got a big purchase, what might you do? If you're buying a car maybe or a house? And you're buying some funds that are in Florida. What kind of thing payment might you have to make? Interest. You just write a paper check or? Yeah, How does the funds actually make it from you to the car dealer or to the private? A wire transfer. That could be another one. So we got Western Union. So you could do a wire transfer. So all of these are kind of different mechanisms. I mean, you might be doing the wire transfer from your 
checking account where you sometimes use your debit card, you sometimes do a paper check, and you could facilitate a wire transfer. So there's lots of different ways um, to make payments. Okay. So how does this compare with money? So what is money? So it's okay for now that we're brainstorming. What is your perception of what money is? Is it 1 through 13? Any commodity or token that is generated, except for gold. Okay, so you went straight to the hardcore definition. Thanks, guys. So is that all of these things? Oh, you said sure, Mo. You're reading a definition, but are you understanding a definition? Why don't you say that a little louder since you brought it up? Say the definition yep. again. Yep. Nice and loud. Uh, any commodity or token that is generally acceptable as a means of payment. Are all of these money according to that definition? Okay, well, I want to hang on our words real closely. Mo, give it to me again. Okay, hold on, slow down. Commodity or token, I guess I'll go back to here. So anything, commodity or token. And then what's the next word? That is generally acceptable. That is generally acceptable as what? As a means of payment. As a means of payment. Are all items one through 13 money? Hanging on that definition tightly, what type of things might not fit that definition? One one means what? Eleven or one extra special twice because it's so good? Eleven. Providing those services. Mallory wants to come back to number eleven. All right. Uh, is this generally accepted as a means of payment? No, it's not generally accepted, right? You go to Walmart, you can't say, oh, how about if I stock your shelves to buy this loaf of bread? So that is not generally accepted as a means of payment. So these were ways to make payments. How do we pay for a good? That's, that could be a lot of things, but this is, would not fall into money. Anything generally acceptable as a means of payment. Okay, what else? Food stamps, generally accepted as a means of payment? Right, but generally accepted for a means of payment for anything. Because that's, that's what the, our definition says. Anything generally accepted as a means of payment. We didn't say a payment for food, we said a payment. So food stamps would not be that you can't go run to uh, the movie theater tonight and, and pay for it there, okay? Trading good for good. How about the loan business? We got loans, we got credit cards. Are loans generally accepted as a means of payment? No, again, we can't normally just go in and buy anything. You might have to go through a credit approval process and whatever, but certainly not as general as we need it to be over there. Now, what about credit cards? <clears throat> Generally accepted as a means of payment. I'd say so. It, it seems to be accepted a lot all over. I'll, I'll agree with you there. That's why this one's a little bit, there, there's, we got to think about it a little bit more on the receiving end. Chelsea, do you got? Okay. So, some of you may not know exactly. You probably do, but maybe you haven't thought that much about it. Does, when you, when you go to Walmart, swipe the card, is Walmart accepting a loan from you? What does Walmart get? Sarah, you've got some experience with Walmart. What does Walmart get? Like, if you buy $100 worth of, of stuff and you swipe that credit card, what does Walmart get? An IOU from you? Walmart gets money. 
So what a credit card really is, is an instant loan to you, between you and your bank or MasterCard or whatever it is, wherever you got that, it's an instant loan to you, but that's not the means of payment to Walmart. They're getting, turns out not quite $100. They're willing to accept a little less because it just helps their business. They're making a business decision. Does every, I guess the flip side of that is, does every business choose to take credit cards? No, because no, there's a fee on, on kind of a couple different ways. There's a processing fee, each swipe, uh, could be as high as $97 that they're losing on in terms of a transaction fee. And then also, if you're a small business owner, um, sometimes you'll have to pay for the equipment to actually do the swiping, or there'll be a service fee at your bank to actually run that through the banking system. So it might cost you, okay, $10 a month to have a credit card, to accept credit cards at your business, plus you have to buy this piece of hardware that runs $100. So you, you've got some costs associated with facilitating, facilitating credit card transfers. And if you're a small business just doing something, you might not want to mess with it. So seems like it's fairly generally acceptable. Of course, it's grown ex exponentially over the last 40 years, um, but not falling into this money category in a pure form. So credit cards are nixed off because this is really an instant loan. And payment comes from a bank account. Now it might be whatever bank you have that credit card with, that money is what's ultimately flowing to Walmart in fairly short order. By the way, they don't get it instantly either. That's usually processed so that there's about a three to four day delay between the time you swipe and the time that they actually get money in their hands that they could spend. Okay, um, checks. What's that? Even the check, kind of the same way like the bank will cash it, but if it bounces and you... Okay. Yeah, yeah, so checks, checks are uh, um, not always accepted by everybody because of the bouncing possibility, um, for one thing. Um, what the check, the check, the little trick to the checks here is that the paper value of the check if we, I want to make a distinction between, I don't know if I got one in here. I thought, I usually try to carry one. It seems like every time I put one, I don't use them very often, so I like to just stuff one in here. I'm sure you guys don't have to have the visual, but I like to be a little more visual. There, I got one. All right, so here's our evaluation. We got this, this, almost the same size, notice, right? So. This one's money, this one's not. And it's partially due to that bounceable feature. What does, what's the important aspect of this piece of paper? That you have it in the bank, that's right. So it's the, the checking account is money. The amount of money that's actually on account with a bank, that is money. The paper check itself is not. The paper check itself is not money. So just a slight distinction there. The checking account is money, though. So checks, no. But let's go ahead and write checking account. That is kind of touching on what we uh, talked about earlier. The paper check is just a mechanism to get the money out of your account. You could be swiping your debit card. So technically. The debit card, the card itself is not money. It's the account that it's linked to. So it too is the checking account. So I want you to start thinking in terms of the money that's on account being uh, the money that we have at our disposal as households. Now, is it possible to uh, use your savings account with your debit card? Are some of you able to? You, so you're, yes, some of you can. It, it's possible to link your savings account to a debit card as well. So let's go ahead and add savings account here as well under the debit card. So again, the card itself's not the money, the account that you have on balance at the bank is the thing that we care about. Wire transfer, where's that money coming from? It's not money, but 
it's again an account. It's t coming from a checking or savings account. So all, what we're starting to see the theme of is that all of this stuff is linked back to some savings account or checking account. Um, if you're do using a credit card, presumably the bank has money on account that it's fronting you for the purchase, right? So that's really the driving factor here when it comes to money uh, is cash and currency plus checking and savings accounts. So that's how the government tracks money. Our official measure of money uh, we're going to talk about in two forms, M1 and M2. So our measure of money, our measure of money that the government has set up and created is simply called M1, is our first measure of money. And M1 is currency plus checking accounts. Checking account deposits. Cash plus accounts. This currency is has another little layer of detail to it, and that's currency held by the public. In other words, the hundred dollar bills that are held in that little drawer that has a big plate of glass or a counter separating you from the teller, that is not included. So vault cash plus cash on hand in, in the banking system is not included. So that's what we mean by currency held by the public, not in bank uh, vault or the drawers. not in the bank vault or the drawers. So not there, that's kind of in the banking system. So we're gonna start to treat things by whether it's kind of out there floating around for transactions or if it's just sitting there on reserve waiting to float around for transactions. So that measure of money does not include savings accounts. Our next measure does. So M2 starts to include savings accounts, but before you write anything more, the most important component of M2 is M1. We're just going to start adding on other things. So it's M1 plus savings accounts plus money market accounts. Plus time deposits. <coughs> Otherwise known as CDs, certificates <coughs> of deposit, time deposits. Certificates of depression is what Dave Ramsey calls them because the interest rates are so low that you just kind of wonder if that's the best place to be putting your money. So what a time deposit is, is if you buy a six month CD, maybe you've heard of your grandparents doing this or because a lot of times uh, they might do it or you might be parking cash that you know you don't want to touch for a little bit. The idea is you give it to the bank for a fixed amount of time, promise not to take it out and they give you a little bit better interest rate on the money. So that's a certificate of deposit. And then if you pull it out early, they, you, there's a little penalty involved. So a substantial penalty for early withdrawal if you've seen 
uh, that advertised on TV or radio. That's what a time deposit is. But it's fairly, um, uh, fairly easy money to access if it's needed. OK, so um, next topic to think about is liquidity. Liquidity. So if, if you have a car that somebody says, well, that's fairly liquidable, what are you trying to do if you're liquidating it? Selling it. So the idea of liquidity is your ability to convert something <coughs> into something else. And this is taken by just about everybody. Once in a while, you find some people that aren't taking cash because they're worried about getting robbed or something. But for the most part, people are OK taking this, right? This has some power. Good old cash. So if you want something, chances are nearly 100%. In fact, if I ask Travis, I know you're using this right now, but I'll give you $10 for it. Would that be OK? Uh, deal. <laughs> no deal. But just trying to illustrate a point. You can transfer this into something else, right? It's fairly easy to transfer this piece of paper that we call a 10 into something else. And so that's the idea of liquidity. So liquidity is the most liquid asset. So cash is the most liquid asset because it's easy to transfer into something else. So there's kind of a couple definitions that we have with liquidity. So liquidity is the ability to uh, transfer one form of wealth, one form of wealth to another. We talked about housing today and how that's part of your wealth bucket. That's part of your bucket of wealth. Liquidable asset or not very liquidable? Is, would you consider a house to be a highly liquid asset? If you have that $20,000 worth of net worth in your, your equity in your house, is that easy to grab onto? Can you go to Walmart and pay with your house equity? No, no not with your balance sheet. Now, you can take a loan against it, and people do home equity loans and that sort of thing. But it's not very liquid. So you own a house, but yet you want some cash. What do you got to do? You got to sell it. How fast is that going to happen? That's what liquidity is all about. Your ability to transfer your house into a vacation down to the Bahamas or something, right? Whatever your other good is from one form of wealth to another. I want to add before you wrap up, I know we're about out. Um, a second definition, since cash is the most liquid, some people think of liquidity as the ability to turn an asset into cash. So the ability, ability to convert an asset to cash. All right, we'll pick up there next time. Have a good weekend. <laughs>